Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at IBM Interconnect 2015. Brought to you by headline sponsor, IBM. Welcome back to Las Vegas, everybody. This is theCUBE, and we're live at IBM Interconnect. We're at the Mandalay Bay. I'm really pleased to have Dion Newman, who's the Vice President of Worldwide Z Marketing, and also Ron Perry, who's the CEO of Radix International. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. It seems like just Thank you. yesterday we were in New York City for the Z <laughs> announcement. You know, you know, it's great to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having us. So that was a great event. Uh, we did it at Jazz at Lincoln Center. I'd never actually been inside. It was a phenomenal venue. You guys really know how to throw a Excellent party, great announcement. <laughs> Customers were pumped up. Um, so you must have felt really good after the you know, results came in on that show. You know, more than that, you know, the reaction to the Z13 have been off the charts. You know, we mm -hmm. had you know, probably 600 articles around the world written on you know, in a 24-hour period. Very, very positive response. I think really a, a repositioning of what the platform's all about. Yeah, so, and Ron, we met actually at dinner the yeah. night before, and um, we want to get into sort of the story, but from a customer perspective, what do you get out of an event like that? Well, I, I think we learn things, certainly, but uh, beyond that, it helps us, it really reinforces uh, the reasons we made the decision. Um, you know, it was uh, really just about three and a half, four months ago when we made the decision. Uh, we took the information we had, we went forward with it, um, and then to see all of the other implications. Very positive, very so, pleased. You know, mainframe cycles, a lot goes into it. I think you had like hundreds of patents. Yeah, about 500 of in uh, just the last year. 500 actually. patents just as part of this announcement. It's, right. it's mind boggling. A uh, huge percentage of the customers um, running Linux. So it's yep. a, you know, the, the, the theme on, on open. So what is this? announcement, this Z13 announcement, what's it mean for IBM's customers and IBM as a company? Well, I think, uh, you know, let, let's sort of start at the beginning. This is a, a totally new system designed from the cast aside. You know, we spent about a billion dollars you know, developing this new generation system. And, you know, it's, it's really been over about five years. You know, these cycles, you know, we're, we're in development of not just next generation, but the one after that. You know, we work with probably 60 clients in our leadership council who help prioritize where we invest and what we build. And it became pretty clear to us sort of two and a half, three years ago that there was this uh, change going on driven by mobile technology. That mobile and the internet of things were going to drive massive transactional growth. And so this system is really built for you know, that mobile scenario. But the other thing which is different here and I think is the thing that's really resonating for clients is for the first time it's practical to do your analytics where you're doing your online transaction mm -hmm. processing. We're bringing that together, and you know, that's a game changer. You know, that really allows you to get to real-time analytics. It allows you to deliver better personalization in those mobile apps, better insight. And I think that's one of the things that's really exciting clients. Let me hit the other thought here, which is you mentioned you know, Linux and uh, you know, the take-up of Linux. You know, on this new Z13, we can run 8,000 VMs mm -hmm. on a single frame. Um, you know, uh, we just had a client, Cicob, uh, the largest credit union in Brazil, 2.5 million clients, and they're saving $1.5 million a year just on the energy bill, hmm. let alone the software savings that they're getting through consolidation of uh, their servers up. They had about 400 servers. They've consolidated all that up onto one uh, Z system. Um, the, the savings are phenomenal. So Z's alive and well. I want to dig into Ron's story now a little bit. I look at you as a, largely a data company, so you talk about yeah, analytics we are. and transactions yeah. coming together. Um, talk a little bit about Radix. Let's mm -hmm. remind our audience what you guys do. Sure. Radix is a company that uh, provides a software as a service to airlines, and that service really is airline reservation systems. So it's the core of the airline's distribution. And what we're doing is uh, selling uh, our services uh, to airlines. So we're not a travel agent, we're not an intermediary for travel agents. We're providing the core systems to the airlines. We have about 40 of them all over the world on five continents. The vast majority are in the developing world. 
And uh, if someone is flying one of our airlines, if they make a booking at their travel agent or they go online to make a booking or they check in with that airline, it all comes back to our uh, computers in Orlando, Florida. Everything's handled there. So what I didn't realize um, before we spoke that night is the how arcane the system is. When you get a ticket and you, 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 you ticket on a different carrier, yeah. the data and information flow is so not real time and the ability to monitor that information yeah. accurately and provide ancillary mm -hmm. services around it. It really didn't exist before Radix, right? That's really yeah, what pretty much. I mean, we, we um, implemented the first uh, graphical interface, internet-based system back in the mid-90s, 95. Uh, and you, you really have in the industry two types of airlines right now. You have one type that uh, uh, uses a traditional business model. They have e-ticketing. They basically are dealing with paper tickets, but they're virtual, so you don't see them. But the flow is the same. And it's a very strange flow, because a paper ticket had to be in one place at a time, so we have an engine that simulates a paper ticket. It's okay. like in the old days when people would just take their brochure and make a website out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, hey, we put our brochure Absolutely. up on a website. Th right? Then you have another type of airline that is purely ticketless, it's just an electronic transaction, it's just like booking a hotel or booking a car. We're somewhat unique in that we support both and we can support both for one airline. So certain things they may want to distribute in a ticketless fashion, others using a traditional mode. Now, we, we started Radix, what, how long ago? Uh, we started in 1993. 93, uh, you know a lot about mainframes. Right? Yeah, you my background a, was mainframes. Long history mainframes, and you chose to start on different infrastructure, non-mainframes, yes. sort of so-called open infrastructure. Exactly. But, but if I understand it, you've swept the floor of that infrastructure now and are, and, and are moving, have moved to a, a, yeah. a, a Z environment. Well, if you were to look at the early 90s, what you would have seen was communications was expensive, you had relatively little bandwidth available, uh, and uh, you know the degree to which someone was moving from mainframes to servers, basically we were looking at local area mainframes replaced with local area servers, local area networks. And so, you know, early to mid 90s, we were still kind of in that frame, and it, uh, software on the mainframes were very expensive. It was a very different world. And so we chose to develop something internet-based, um, Windows front end at that point, uh, and really uh, attempting to build in a very different way. Um, what we've seen though is, building out with servers, you wind up getting to a point where the benefits begin to diminish. Because as you add more and more servers, the complexity increases. And you wind up with all of this, this multiplicity of multi-vendor um, components constantly getting changes being made to them by their manufacturers, uh, and then you're trying to manage that as if it's a single entity. Very, very hard. Now, you, you have a lot of custom code that you've developed. Oh yeah, we have right? so many you, millions of lines and of custom code. You've had to port that over to uh, a, 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 a Z environment, and so I, I think back to my days of consulting with large mainframe customers, and one of the challenges that they always had was that if they had a lot of COBOL code, they couldn't, yeah. they had to freeze the code, but they didn't want to freeze the code. If they didn't freeze the code, they were in big trouble, mm -hmm. right, because by the time they, they migrated, so there was this endless loop, and so they said, all right, forget it, it's too complicated. You didn't run into those problems. No, and actually, why? that was you, one of the most amazing things. Going from mainframes to servers was an 18 month to two year project, rewriting code and the rest. Now we're taking, we're running on Linux on the servers, and uh, we're running on the database, running on Linux, and so we're just, loading in more servers, they just happen to be inside of a, a, a Z box. Uh, and so instead of provisioning all those individual servers with all the wires, the routers, and everything else, we're just uh, duplicating or replicating uh, the database and turning so on the strikes, standby. Dion, this strikes to the heart of the Z strategy that, that was you know, initiated you know, many years ago. Right. Uh, talk about that and why it's so important. So, you know, 14 years ago, we put Linux on the mainframe. It was a, it was a side project in Birmingham. They called us up and said, hey, we've, we've, we've put Linux on the mainframe. We hey, said, nice. why did you do that? You know, <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> we'll and uh, so, you know, fast forward now, you know, there's uh, over 30 million MIPS that are out there from a capacity standpoint for mainframes. We're at a point where 27%, 8 million MIPS now are Linux. 27% of all mainframe capacity is now Linux. Hmm. Now, that Linux is not a special, you know, mainframe Linux, it's Linux. You know, it is, Linux is yeah. Linux, and by the way, Java is Java. There's another six million MIPS, mm -hmm. you know, some 20, 22% of all that mainframe capacity, which is Java. 
So we actually have you know, the system where basically 50% of all mainframe workload now is either Java or Linux mm. uh, you know, based. And you know, that's bringing all sorts of workloads onto the mainframe. We see a lot of clients consolidating. Uh, you know, lifting up you know big server farms and just pulling them in and uh, dropping them on a mainframe. And the balance of those workloads are stuff that, that works. Yeah. You don't want to mess with. It's secure. It's fast. Yeah. I'm not going to touch that. Yeah. So you're seeing new growth as a result of Linux, Java, modernization of the platform. Yeah. You know, we're uh, we're seeing you know in excess of about a 30% CAGR on uh, Linux growth on the platform. We see big growth there, and you know the. The, the arguments are, are several. The first is you've got the reliability of the Z system. The second is huge software savings. We're seeing consolidation uh, down. You know, we're able to probably on every IFL, you know, we're able to bring across 40, 50 VMs mm -hmm. on a single uh, integrated facility for Linux. Um, the maintenance becomes much easier. You don't have people running around with fixed packs and sort of fixing things that break and plugging new wires in and new routers in and connecting things up. It, it all happens and all of the management can be done you know, within that single single frame. Big space savings, um, you know, big energy savings. So we're on, okay, so people will say, well, aren't mainframes expensive? Um, what are you finding? Well, actually, I mean, we approach things basically on a lease basis, typically, when we look at a three-year horizon. And if you look in that three years and you say, okay, we're going to buy this one box, and uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to spread out the cost over three years, um, and then you figure there'll be some additions during that time, but all inside the box. Uh, and you compare that to a server farm where you're constantly adding servers, and you're constantly dealing with the changes that come, and the servers that you add at the beginning may be from the same vendor, but they may be very different two years later. And so you're dealing not just with a multiplicity of vendors, but you're at different versions and the rest of these servers, different internal drivers and the rest. And you start adding that up, the expense is significantly greater. Well, that, essentially that space of the industry, the part that you sweep in the floors, they're all sort of building with so-called converged systems, trying to build mainframes, right. essentially. That's exactly right, right. it's, it's do-it-yourself mainframes, no yeah. question. <laughs> so, I mean, what do you make of that trend, right? You see that, that coming in, you say, okay, that's validation, but no, you've got to compete with that. Well, it's, I mean, Ron, if you look at, you know, I won't ask you to talk financials, uh, yeah. but, but if you were going to estimate your, you know, savings over that three-year period, like what, what would be your estimate? In terms of actual dollars? No. In terms, oh, in terms of percentage? It was 35%. 35% thirty-five percent reduction in total cost of ownership uh, between uh, what we're what we had projected with the server farms uh, and what we at this point are seeing with the Z. And uh, some of the things were surprises. So for example, labor cost, it is so much easier to manage uh, a Z than it is to manage a complex server farm. And I mean, it's like fighting brush fires, getting reliability out of a server farm. You know, you're constantly dealing with little different things happening. You've got to I was going to ask you, I mean, anytime we've done a lot of TCO work in our day, yeah. you know, we all have obviously looked at it. It's, the big nut is always labor. It's a very labor intensive business, the, the IT organizations. So it, it comes from labor savings. That's how, right. How do, you, how do you quantify that? Is that a redeployment? of labor, do you not hire new people as a result of that? Do you actually reduce FTEs? How do you Well, we're not going to reduce FTEs, but we are, um, uh, there are hires we're not going to make, mm -hmm. and that's fairly easy for us to project, because right. we knew what our plan was. Uh, we are redeploying some of our folks to areas that we wanted to address that we couldn't, and that now we'll be able to. Um, but labor really is just one piece of it. There's, Where else? Well, Where power. That? So. Uh, the total power of the Z right now, power consumption, is um, roughly a third of what uh, the servers are taking that it's replacing. Okay, and uh, we have our own data center at our headquarters. We also use space at a co-location center. The co-location center charges for power. So that's a significant factor when you're looking at it. And then space, you know, I mean, as we grow, we had projected taking significantly more space now the space is inside the box. Well, what's your take on cloud? Well, I've talked to a lot of CEOs and they say, oh, I just want to outsource the whole darn thing. <laughs> <You know>? Well, <laughs> I mean, I think that the logical uh, point of delineation is the API. So from the API back, API database and so on, data warehouse and all, all of our messaging, 
all of our payment processing communications and so on, that'll be on the mainframe. Um, anything in front of that, what IBM would refer to as the systems of engagement in the cloud. Now, we've already dabbled a little bit with the cloud, but ultimately our plan is to move everything on the front end to the cloud. For us, it's very practical. We have airlines all over the world. If we can move the hosting of those systems of engagement close to those airlines, we can reduce the latency. Reduce the latency, you shorten the transaction time. If you shorten the transaction time, you reduce the load on the systems of record. So, in thinking about this nice 35% yeah. TCO savings, but if I compare that to what you just described as the business value, I would think the yeah. business value would deliver telephone numbers relative to the cost savings. Is that a fair assessment? I'm not sure I quite understand. The value that you're getting out of the yeah. reduced latency, improved yeah, productivity sure. of the business, and the, the dollar value that that delivers yeah. is I would think much greater. It's, maybe, it's pretty, maybe it's pretty substantial. Well, I mean, than the cost savings. Uh, yeah, no question. I mean, when you start looking at increasing the performance, uh, you know, so much of what we see now is somebody with a cell phone uh, who is trying to find out, uh, am I on board that flight? Did I get my seat upgrade? Uh, you know, uh, checking in and doing any number of other things. But when it, particularly when you get to the buy side, where they're making the initial purchase. Um, you know, that's the difference between getting a booking or not. And since we charge a transaction fee, we're really just a large virtual airline that has 40 fulfillment partners all over the world. We want them to grow. We want them to get as many bookings as they can possibly get. And if the system is slow, there are fewer bookings. So the revenue side, that's not even taken into that TCO discussion. What more can you tell us about mobile? Well, let me actually start with, sure. with DM. Mo mobile's a big thrust, IBM right. is a company, sure. uh, but specifically the, the Z Group. Uh, talk a little bit about mobile, and I want to understand, Ron, how it's affected your business, but what's the, what's the mobile thrust? Well, at, at the end of the day, the new battleground is client experience. You know, it's about being available always, always on, you know, 24-7, 365, when I reach my phone, when I get out of bed and check my bank balance, or I decide that I want to buy something, if the site's not available, I'm going to go somewhere else. So there's a number of things that we see, you know, you need speed. That's probably the, the, the first thing, you know. You, we expect that in one second or less that we'll get the response we're looking for. So when we go to that app, we hit the button, we want speed. Secondly, availability, that 24-7 that I was talking about. Then you start talking about differentiation as you deal with me. So the demographic of one. So think about personalization. And that's where this analytic story sort of comes in and why we brought the analytics together with the, the transaction speed. Because you want to personalize the information. You know, treat me as a single customer who's got a, got a history with you, who's got particular likes or dislikes in the travel industry. You know, maybe I like hotels downtown. You know, maybe I like to sit in this sort of a seat. You know, maybe I like to go to the theater. You know, may, maybe, you know, I have all of these preferences. Treat me as a customer. You don't treat me as some random person who got on my website. So that personalization is really important. And then security. You know, we're putting all this information, our credit card information. You know, may, maybe there's a social element, a you know, social security number uh, element to this thing. So security, you know, matters here as well. So one more I want to give you is uh, scalability. So I heard this great story about this bank in Australia, and their marketing department. Uh, deployed this app, and I'll tell you a little bit about it in a second. But the back end guys, the guys in the in the glass house, they suddenly saw spikes on the system on Sunday night, and they, they they could not work out what was going on. Now they're running a Z, which automatically just you know moved more resource, you know, and and managed the spike. But it turned out that this they'd run a TV ad that showed that if you shook your phone, you didn't have to enter the app. It just brought your credit, your uh, your banking balance up onto the front of the phone. And so all of these people watching TV, you know, watching this high rating, you know, whatever the show was, were sitting there shaking their phone, and suddenly there were tens of thousands more transactions running through, you know, doing account balance checks. And, you know, so you need to be able to cope with those spikes, because the last thing we want is, you know, denial, you know, I can't, can't do it right now, system's breaking, you just can't have that. So, you know, what we focus on is, is delivering that performance or that speed. You know, we can do 30,000 transactions per second or two and a half billion a day. You know, that's like 100 Cyber Mondays you can do on one of these Z13s. Uh, we're focused on availability. That's always been the hallmark uh, of our platform. Uh, the best security in the industry, which is, again, a hallmark uh, of Z. 
And then, you know, bringing this analytics in, it's, uh, it's about personalization. So, you know, we think we've designed something for the mod modern sort of digital economy and, you know, we think it's uh, going to be very successful. Yeah, you're hitting a lot of those trends. I want to come back to the, the, yeah. the, the mobile piece and, and talk in the context of your industry, your customers, um, this, they've gone through some tough times in the past decade, right? With fuel prices going through the roof, and, but now, They've seemed to rationalize their cost structures. Yeah. Fuel prices have dropped dramatically, and you're seeing the airline stocks are booming, mm -hmm. right? Things are things are good. Now you have also mobile as a as yeah. a tailwind. The economy's you know obviously do, doing better than it was five years ago. Um, what does that mean for your customers' business, and obviously sure. ultimately yours? Okay, uh, what what mobile means is massive additional demand on the systems of record, massive, and I'll, I'll give you. Um, uh, a statistic. Okay, um, airlines talk about look to book ratio. So if you were to go back when bookings were made through the call center, rule of thumb was three to four calls for one booking. So look to book ratio of let's say four. Um, today, uh, two things are driving a massive look to book ratio. One is mobile, the other is the online travel agency. And the combination of those two, on a typical day, we will see 200 or 300 looks to one book. Wow. On a sale day, it'll get to 2,000, sometimes more. We had one airline a few years back that gave away a million free seats in India. They had 70 million availability requests, which is a look. <laughs> they got 85,000 bookings that day. So it's killing the normal ratios in your business. Uh, no question. But, but, it's, but it's, it's driving business through and, the roof. And it's totally unpredictable because <laughs> the difference is with mobile, it's unconstrained. When somebody had to go to a computer and sit down somewhere, that limited them in times of access. Now, they're standing in a bus line, uh, they're pretty much anywhere, and they're using our systems and spawning hundreds and thousands of uh, transactions. This is a great story, so it just really underscores the, the tension in your business, how you can put it in an infrastructure that does matter, that's a big theme of IBM's at the show, infrastructure matters, I'm an infrastructure guy, so I always felt like it matters. <laughs> yeah. But so, uh, and it really matters when it doesn't work, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Um, so, it's people, the people notice. Yeah, right. um, but your business would be quite a bit different without this transition. You'd have to pour a lot more, if I'm hearing it right, a lot more people, you'd have to deal with a lot more security issues, you'd have to spend a lot more money, yeah, and it's absolutely. taking away from an opportunity, that would be taking away from an opportunity that you see as a CEO, that's what you care about. Yeah, no question. Plus it creates a competitive advantage for us. Mm -hmm. People um, just intuitively know the mainframe is more reliable. They know it's more scalable without looking at any of the numbers. And so it's positioned us very differently to have modern software running on a rock solid uh, base. Well Ron, it's a great case study, you know, bringing that analytic piece into your business with the transactions, you know, the volume. Um, Dion, I'll give you the last word. You know, what's the, what's the big themes that you want people to remember? I mean, you touched on a lot of them. We're here at Interconnect. Uh, we've got, you know, all kinds of action going on in cloud and mobile and and, and analytics, so what's the, what's the final message? Well, you know, I, so I've talked a lot about mobile and I've talked a lot about analytics and we talked about Linux consolidations and uh, you know, a little bit about cloud, but there are a couple of other things which are worth mentioning, uh, which, are, which are new news. Um, we've done a lot around software pricing, you know, really game change stuff. So we've, we've uh, brought out what we call uh, ICAP, or it's basically containerized pricing for incremental workloads that come onto the platform. Uh, essentially isolating that workload, you know, making sure that the costs associated with that software are independent, and we're getting a lot of excitement from clients on that. New flexibility like we've never had before. Um, multiplex pricing that allows you know, in-country to consolidate uh, MIPS up for a mainframe client. This has been a big ask, and uh, so we announced that as well. Bluemix for the first time, uh, full Z participant participation now with Bluemix. So that's, a, that's another new thing we've added. Um, another key pricing action we've taken is around memory. So on this new system, we've got uh, 10 terabytes of, um, of memory you know, as a maximum on the system. Before, the maximum was three terabytes. Uh, for many of our clients, that'll mean they can go 3x to 5x what they're currently running on their systems. So uh, we really want to encourage that. You know, as we see more Linux workloads going on, we've, you know, we've added SMT to the platform, we think there's going to be a lot more Linux coming onto the platform, it'll help with Java performance as well. We've taken the axe to memory pricing, and you know, for many clients, it'll be 
of what they paid for memory in the past. So you could basically, for what you used to buy your memory for, you could now get 3x. You know, in fact, if you get more than that, you'll, you'll see an even bigger saving. But you know, for many of our clients, they'll see dramatic savings around memory, and you know that's going to deliver immediate performance improvements. It'll mean less, you know, uh, less uh, pressure on the processes. You know, it'll, it'll mean we're spending less time moving data around, um, and uh, you know, we're seeing very large projections on performance improvement because of that uh, that additional memory in the systems. So mainframe cycles are obviously a big deal for, for the, the Z division, yep. big deal for IBM. I talked to a number of customers at, uh, at your event, and several said, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm buying, not yep. I'm thinking about it. I'm buy one in fact said I'm buying four sight unseen. Yep. Um, so that's great, it's great news for IBM, uh, it's great news for the, for the Z platform, and I think great news for customers. So gentlemen, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE, it's really a pleasure having you, great Thank story. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. All right, keep it right there, everybody, we'll be back. This is theCUBE, we're live from IBM Interconnect at the Mandalay Bay, this is theCUBE.